Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ventures, a show where my guests and I get to explore entrepreneurial stories, market landscapes, problem spaces, and examine together how new ventures might be able to be created, either for-profit, non-profit, personal ventures, to benefit humanity. Really, the purpose of this show is to educate and inspire a new generation of venture builders and venture investors to make the world a better place. Today's episode is really an extension of last week's episode, where we're looking at the state of blockchains and DeFi and the Web3 stack. But today we dive into specifics, specific resources, specific tools, specific ways that you can educate yourself and begin tinkering, building applications in the Web3 stack. So my guest today is Andy Kronk. You might remember him from episode two, where we were talking about Figment. And Figment provides a number of services for token holders, for people spinning up new blockchains, and for developers that are looking to build decentralized applications. And Andy is a co-founder of Figment, and for full disclosure, I am personally a, an investor, and my, my company ProtoVentures is an investor in Figment. So if you are watching this show, you can listen anywhere that you get your podcasts. You can just search for ventures. Or if you're listening, you can visit wclittle.com and there you'll find more extensive show notes and links to the different resources that we talk about today. So with that, please enjoy this conversation with Andy Crow. All right, Andy, welcome back. Hey, thanks for having me, Will. I'm, uh, I was honored to be on episode number two. I don't know how many you're up to now, but uh, I'm glad to, glad to come back on. I believe this will be episode 19. So I'm, I'm glad glad to have you. Excited to chat about blockchains and Figment and, and a variety of different things here. Yeah, it looks like the season's changed for you. I see a fire roaring and some some snow. And as we've sort of had a little bit of a season change in blockchain, in blockchain as well. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we were all expecting two to three inches last night. We ended up getting over seven and, and, and counting. So that we've had an interesting morning here. <laughs> So, yeah, so so catch us up for those that may or may not have uh, seen episode two over the summer. There, what's what's been happening in in, in the blockchain world? Sure. So um, uh, for folks who are around in 2017 time, you might remember the ICO boom and craze. Well, we had a, a sort of smaller version of it, which maybe didn't bubble up all the way as uh, into the public uh, mind as the ICO boom did, but it was a boom nonetheless. And it's still ongoing, and we might have sort of a second wave. And this is all around this concept of DeFi or short for decentralized finance. And uh, what's happening here is people are looking to invent different ways to do things in a blockchain that you might have had to do with the bank before. And so a simple example is, you know, let's say I want to get a loan. Maybe I go uh, sit down in a bank and fill out some forms and, and talk to a loan officer. Well, could we do this without having to talk to anyone? Could you do it programmatically uh, in a decentralized way? And that is that sort of concept um, has been around for a while in the blockchain space, and they have some fancy terms for it, like collateralized debt positions, which are really just over collateralized loans. Um, but this concept uh, from this basic idea has been all sorts of things have come out of this. And so that is one of the first tenets of this sort of idea of DeFi. And there's entire websites and blogs and podcasts just dedicated to this topic. But maybe the key thing to, to take away for, for people who are, who are, are watching from arm's length is just that um, uh, a number of different things that we have done in uh, with banks before, maybe we could do without banks. And uh, maybe a place I, I'd recommend your listeners check out is a podcast and website called Bankless, mm -hmm. like without a bank, Bankless. Uh, bankless to Substack, to paid Substack, but the, the free stuff is pretty good and it kind of will get you into this, this sort of DeFi space. That's amazing, that's amazing. Yeah. So what, what have you all been up to uh, over, over at Figment? Sure, yeah. So. Um, you know, Figment uh, was really started with this idea that um, the, the current blockchains that we saw in 2016 and 2017 were interesting and that the way that we can move this space forward and really the point of it is to discover new killer apps is launch a bunch of new blockchains. Mm -hmm. And so we picked a technology called Proof of Stake and really said, we think Proof of Stake can help launch uh, a lot of new blockchains. And it was from that basic idea that we sort of started a company in this space. And so the, the thing to know is that we have this common core belief, but we're doing lots of different experiments and, and things which, which kind of go towards this aim, which is if we can launch more blockchains and iterate them 
faster, we can discover more killer apps and more use cases. And so even as a company, we, we've had a number of initiatives. Some have been more successful than others, but really there's we've we settled in on, on two personas or two user types uh, that we're servicing and we're doing it right now with three products. So the first thing we did was for proof of stake, we launched this concept of, of validator or really infrastructure provider. And uh, we're, we're, we're similar to a miner in Bitcoin or Ethereum, we're sort of providing that sort of uh, uh, security to the network. And that was great. And that's sort of well understood. And that was sort of the original thesis for, the, for where we should jump off with Figment. But we, we discovered two new interesting things after that. One was uh, after, you, if you launch a bunch of new networks, the first question is, is are, they, are they working? Uh, who's using them? And so that's what this concept of Hubble, and you can think of Hubble like Google Analytics for blockchains. Who's using what, what's happening where, how can I create my own custom alerts? And it's really for people who are watching these networks, whether they're token holders or, or users in a different way. That's Hubble. And this all kind of goes to this use case or persona of a token holder. And so we have two things which are really serving token holders. One is our staking or validating business and two is this Hubble product. And where we, we went to next is that we kept pulling this thread. We launched networks and then we show how they're being used with analytics but how can we get more people building on them? How can we discover more killer apps? And so we started turning our attention to developers and we have recently launched a product called Data Hub. And you can think of Data Hub sort of like, um, like AWS or blockchains. How can we make it easier for people who don't want our own infrastructure, but want to sort of use a, a cloud-like service to, to write apps for blockchains? And we, we soft launched that product earlier this year and have been testing with a number of networks. And what you'll see from us coming up, and I'm happy to share here sort of a sneak peek, is that we, as we were launching that and we were having more people test it, the, the first thing that people said was, um, what's missing in this space is really a way to get people started. It's so it's what's missing is a way to uh, sort of uh, a Coursera for, for these blockchain networks. And so we took it upon ourselves to create that. And you'll see a new product we're launching on Tuesday of next week. It's called Figment Learn. And if you're familiar with a product like Coinbase Earn, where you kind of go through tutorials to get up to speed as a user of networks, this is a way for developers to, to learn how to uh, you know submit your first transaction, create your first dApp, things like that. And so um, we're rounding out our product suite right now with, with this sort of fourth edition. So it was staking and Hubble, really for token holders. And now we've got Data Hub, which is a low level infrastructure product. And now Learn, which is a way to onboard you know all these new developers to, to really uh, educate them about what's possible uh, to, to use blockchains. That's amazing. That's amazing. So yeah, that, that, that will actually correspond with the scheduled release of this show. So the Tuesday, so those who are listening, that check it out. <laughs> links, links to the show notes for that. So that's, that's super exciting. So uh, a few questions. Let, let's maybe start with uh, may, maybe more on the dumb question. Why do we need all these extra blockchains? I mean, Ethereum sounds like they're moving to proof of move proof of stake. Uh, why why not just build all my things on Ethereum? Sure, yeah. So um, I, I make an analogy, and maybe it's unfair, but um, it's helpful for me to think about what could be. And the analogy is, um, uh, what if Ethereum was MySpace and we never got to uh, Facebook and Snapchat and TikTok? Mm -hmm. uh, meaning that everyone thought, uh, at least I did, you know, when I set my eight friends on MySpace, this is social networking, right? Um, but what was missing is there's a ton of technology shifts, uh, you know, mobile being one of them, uh, that sort of led to the, sort of the next generation. And so when I look at Ethereum, to me, it's, it's of course, it was, it was transformational in terms of this concept of run decentralized applications. But I think that there's been a number of, of technology shifts uh, and even just different attempts uh, at evolving the technology that are worth, worth seeing out. And so, you know, our position at Figment is we are not trying to be kingmakers. We're not trying to say this is the best technology, but we're trying to promote diversity. We're trying to see lots of different things launch. And, and, and with the idea being that iteration is the best way to, to find uh, these killer use cases. And so what we mentioned, we kind of kicked off with what have we been seeing in the sort of this DeFi bubble that kind of went through the summer here. Um, what what you might what I think is going to happen is that Ethereum will really become focused on these financial applications, mm. and it will sort of look like modern payment rails. It will look like a, a giant decentralized bank, maybe. Um, but the promise of of with this this notion of Web three or what comes after Web two, how can we as users take back our privacy, take back our data? I don't think that's going to be served by Ethereum. Mm. And you know the the there's an idea that. Ethereum will move to Ethereum 2, and that will solve a lot of the challenges. Um, my own personal opinions on Ethereum 2 are, um, I think it's going to be a long way out. And I, I, I think that 
there's a lot of networks that are launching now, which have a chance to really jump on this Web3 uh, opportunity before Ethereum 2 will really ever kind of come into existence. And so I'm um, not saying ETH2 won't be successful, but I'm just saying there's a, there's a, a more desire than ever uh, to sort of move to this Web3 paradigm. Um, and I don't think that ETH2 will be in market to capitalize on it. But there's a lot of new chains which are launching and have launched um, that could capitalize on it. And to kind of drive this home, to move from the abstract to the concrete, we, we did a, a fun quiz inside our company. Uh, a number of our employees have kids. And we said, uh, if you have a new baby, where are you going to upload the photos? And uh, it, was, it was sort of a benign question, but it was really like, are you going to upload your baby photos to Facebook? Mm. And no one said yes. Mm. And why'd they say, why'd they, why'd they say that? Well, Facebook's going to use it to advertise against me. It's going gonna, it's gonna to take all my information. And we said, well, where is, is a way for you to like, uh, make, use these social functions, connect uh, uh, on the web, but without giving away all your information and, and giving away your privacy? And so I think just that small example is, is why I'm really excited about uh, this sort of resurgence of Web3 or redefining Web3 as, as sort of decentralized applications. Um, and that is in addition to this sort of DeFi movement or this decentralized finance movement. Um, but that's really where we're seeing a lot of sort of developer energy, which is people who are fed up uh, with having their, their data used against them or, or uh, used to addict them to things um, and also a loss of privacy. So I love that question. What, what yeah. were some of the answers for today, and 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 perhaps more importantly, how far away are we from uploading our baby photos into a a application built on on Web three the Web three stack? Sure, yeah. So there's lots of so the answers in, internally were um, uh, maybe indicative of of some biases of the fact that we have a developer centered company. Um, there was a, a general idea that, you know, maybe if I create a shared group, Apple will keep me safe because Apple has good, you know, privacy uh, thoughts around it. Maybe, maybe not. But uh, of course, a lot of the developers are Android focused too. And I'm sure you saw what happened with Google Photos this week where they said, you know, we're not going to offer free storage anymore. And so I think people are uh, looking for different solutions. And so there's a few approaches I've seen. Um, one uh, is to upload it to a large repository that's encrypted, something like IPFS, the Interplanetary File System. Um, and then each of anyone who you want to grant access to it can sort of have a permission to, to go to this, uh, this large data store. Uh, a really cool approach that I've seen is actually, um, it's almost like the plot of the HBO show Silicon Valley, where people can actually uh, do partial storage on their phones for their photos. And everyone in their group is partially storing all the, the, the copies. Like th there's, this is more than just the concept. Like this is actually, I've seen this working um, in, in, the, in the real world. So I don't know how this is gonna play out. I think it's largely gonna be driven by who can uh, mimic the, the, the similar UX of, of the ease of use. But uh, people are looking for solutions because they're starting to care about privacy. So, you know, the, the trope has always been people don't care about their privacy and they're willing to forego privacy for, for UX. Um, but in our small data sets, we're seeing people make the different choice now, just based on um, how powerful the data silos uh, have become. Hmm. So what? So you, you referred earlier to about some technology shifts. What what are some of those technology uh, shifts? Maybe to get get in the weeds here a little bit. Sure. Are, do you mean um, for for some of these new proof of stake networks that we're seeing launch? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I know I've said the word privacy a lot today, but that is probably one of the, the um, maybe most cutting edge use cases that we're seeing. And it's really um, revolving around um, what's available uh, at a hardware level of all things. So there's a few technologies. Uh, the, the general thing is called a trusted execution environment or TEE. Um, a a well-known one is, is called SGX, Intel SGX. Um, and we've seen a number of new blockchains launch around this sort of secure enclave concept, this, this trusted execution environment um, and really focused on Intel SGX for now. So if you wanna look at what's going on, um, there's a couple that come to mind. One is called Oasis. So if you look up Oasis Network, um, you'll see what they're doing. Uh, another one is called Secret. It used to be called Enigma, but if you go to secret.network, uh, um, that's another one. And the, the key idea here is that we, we talked about in proof of stake, it's run by these validators. The validators are looking and verifying all the transactions. But what, uh, what if as a validator, as our company Figment, what if we were validating a transaction, but we couldn't actually see the data? What if the, the data was unencrypted in this secure enclave that we did, couldn't see, we could verify um, that, that it, uh, the transaction was correct? And so this idea of private computation and decentralized private computation 
is what I would see uh, is really at the cutting edges. And we're seeing these networks launch now. Uh, Secret launched, I think, within the last month. And Oasis has a mainnet up now. And I think they're going to uh, move from sort of a, a, a partially launched mainnet to a full one. And we're going to see all sorts of applications. And, mm -hmm. and so to kind of drive this home with an example, um, one of the applications we've seen uh, is this concept of uh, uh, kind of gets back to this idea of, of users owning their data, but also sharing it in a private way. So there was a company that wanted to look at um, uh, X-ray or MRI sort of imaging data, and they wanted to allow you to uh, uh, scan, uh, say, scan my X-rays um, and and use it for, for machine learning. But they didn't want me to have to like give away uh, uh, the rights to my images and things like that. So the system can actually uh, allow me to retain ownership. Uh, of my imagery, uh, allow it to be scanned in very specific context and used to train a model. And then, uh, you know, the, the end result, the asset, the image doesn't reside with the company, it resides with me. Mm. And so these are the kind of things that we're seeing uh, available for the first time. So you could think of it sort of like anonymous uh, model training, uh, things like that. Um, these are new use cases that we're seeing. And would the people that are training these models have to pay you essentially with some kind of token to access? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. So that 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 is sort of what I see coming up next is sort of the the, the compensation for it. Um, I think that is maybe an easier challenge to solve or more more uh, easier to understand. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that looks like a micro payments back to me every time someone wants to use my data. There could be a marketplace model. I don't know. I think those that will be emergent. But to me, what I'm always looking for at the leading edge is what can we do now that we could never do before. Um, and so this idea of sort of like anonymous or, or private training of models with my data where I, I maintain ownership of my data, that's the sort of, so what? Mm -hmm. um, and then, so how does it go to market work? How does the conversation work? Yes, I, I agree. There's, there's actually a lot of innovation that has to occur there, um, but I'm excited just for the possibilities. And at a more basic level, is the, are those images sitting on IPFS or, or where are they physically stored? Are they sharded out to everybody's phones already? Or Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I For this specific company and use case, um, I can provide you a link if you want to put in the show notes. I don't know that, that implementation detail. But yeah, this, it's a good question. Um, where are we going to put our stuff? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a really good question uh, because uh, what we've learned, if anything, from, from Web2 is that the free stuff wins and, and monetizing with ads has won. And uh, will we recreate that with Web3? Will we go to a more direct micropayments model? I don't know. Um, yeah, uh, I just mentioned earlier that Google has decided that they're not gonna give you free photo storage anymore. Um, Amazon still gives it if you're a Prime customer. And so uh, will we keep sort of moving in the direction that we're seeing, say journalism move to, where people are, are paying for journalism now, you know, direct subscriptions, direct, direct monetization. Um, is the era of, of indirect monetization or free, but not really free because you're the product, is that over? And and uh, that's what I'm watching. Hmm. Got it, cool. So what, what areas are you in the sort of short to medium term future? I guess I have two questions. Like what, what areas are you most curious about personally? And then the, the age old question in blockchain is how do you get your information? <laughs> how yeah. do you keep up with the news it's almost by definition difficult to to discover news given how decentralized everything is. So I'm curious right. to, to hear your thoughts on, on on those. I'm happy to give a plug. Um, I think there's a, a company doing really good work on the second part, the news part. Hmm. Um, so we have people in Figment who are, are just research analysts and their job is to try to sort this out. Uh, hmm. One for the internal company use and then two um, for our customers. And also we, we publish just tons of content about what we're seeing and learning. But the plug I want to give is for a company called Masari, M-E-S-S-A-R-I. Um, it's actually a service we subscribe to. Um, they are going in at these very low level granular details, pumping out uh, all the updates and information. And you can sort it for you know what level you want to subscribe to. But this is a company that uh, has been in the sort of content space for a while. And I think they've hit on a, a big winner in a product here. So that's, that's one where for us, Figment, as a crypto team, as a blockchain team, it's very useful. Um, I've not tested it for people who are just sort of uh, watching maybe um, from a arm's length, but uh, that's a product that we've, we've enjoyed using quite a bit. Very, very cool. And then in terms of um, uh, what I'm excited about, uh, I mentioned already the sort of uh, privacy piece. I, I think we're gonna see new things happen there. Um, and I, I forgot to mention earlier when I was sort, of, sort of going through the exercise of like, where are you gonna upload your, your kids' photos? There is a new uh, uh, site taking a crack at this. I think it's called Slate. I'll have to look at the URL, Slate, that's something. But it is built on IPFS and it is built around this concept of, of 
you own your, your data. So um, there's at least pr prototype proof of concepts out there. Um, but like w I give the example of an image or a photo because it's very tangible. You know, it's everyone, everyone knows that they have photos and they need to put them somewhere, but you're right to call out like, what about all your data? Is, it, is this personal digital locker concept finally going to come into existence? Um, I don't know, uh, but that's one thing I'm definitely watching. Mm. Got it. Mm -hmm. So then in, in the blockchain world, right, there's, there's lots of interdisciplinary conversations happening. And I, I found that people get overwhelmed extremely easily. Um, people, you know, there's sort of the, the wild investors that, that are, are pumping coins and kind of just playing around pure speculation and just trying to pay, play, pay money. There are the economists that are looking at it from a, the, this is an amazing future of, of wealth transfer and, and, and market economies. And then there are sort of the game theory people, the mathematicians. Where in, 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 in all of those tribes, where do you personally uh, hang out the most? Or, or do you find yourself hanging out uh, across all of them? Uh, with all the skeptics. So, you know, the, the thing we like to say about Figment is that we are uh, optimistic skeptics. And what that means is that um, it's very easy to get swept up with uh, token prices, with return on investments, all that kind of stuff. But um, so far, most of that's been very short term. And so we're always looking at um, how will this change someone who's not yet using blockchain? Um, how will this, this impact their life? And so there's three areas that I think that um, so far to me have, have sort of showed signs of life or shown uh, things that could be interesting. Um, and I'll run through them really quickly and this is by no means exhaustive, but um, uh, the three things that, which I think are working and you could show them to someone and they might be able to say, I know how to use that. One uh, is the easy one, which is speculation. Uh, speculation is the number one use case of blockchain so far, for better or worse. Um, and the, 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 maybe the, the nice spin on that is to say price discovery. Uh, we, have, we have crazy new way, 24 seven markets uh, to do price discovery. Um, but I put that in the bucket of speculation and I'd say companies like Coinbase, that's, that's what they've made their business on. And I think for this space to grow, we have to transcend speculation. And we, I mentioned earlier DeFi um, as a way to sort of um, get loans without your bank, that is a good user uh, behavior. But the reason DeFi was popular was because people were doing more speculation. They, 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 at the end of the day, the, there, was, there was a lot going on that was uh, unrelated to the actual use case of, can I get a loan without, uh, without having to go into a bank and fill out paperwork? So I think that um, speculation is, is, a, is a real use case. And for better or worse, uh, you, can, you can do that if you'd like. Um, I think the DeFi is emerging. Um, I mentioned this idea about loans and the sort of basic concept of what's called a CDP. Um, but there's also uh, a second uh, thing, which I think is very important, which has come around, which is this concept of an automated market maker. And maybe the most famous one is Uniswap. And uh, it's been in economic uh, theory for a long time, but really we've not been able to put it into practice um, uh, of actually having um, a market that can run by itself and you could price anything, any pair of assets, and you could do it in a decentralized way without having to have an order book. And so this concept, uh, that might sound like, like a lot, but the, the, the point is to say that there's been many iterations on this concept of an AMM, uh, but the, the so what of it is, is that uh, markets can be created frictionlessly. You can be created without having to go get yourself listed anywhere. And for better or worse, uh, this is something that I think is going to be very powerful in the future. So those are maybe two which are, are, are more well known in terms of uh, the speculation use case, which you know I don't I don't denigrate too much. I'm just saying uh, I think there, there's good and bad to it in this DeFi use case. The third one, which I think we're going to see probably really blow up in 2021, is what is insiders call NFTs or non fungible tokens, or you could think about like collectible collectible baseball cards, and so. Um, You've probably seen Pokemon blowing up, card trading blowing up. Um, this is something where uh, if you look to a product called NBA Top Shots, um, they have sort of collectibles now that you can sort of buy these moments from NBA. Um, I think this use case uh, is, is, is here, it exists. The technology is ready. Uh, there's lots of uh, companies getting on board. Um, and if the, the key thing I look to for traction here is there's a marketplace called OpenSea, OpenSEA. Um, where these these collectibles are traded. So if you just replace the word NFT with baseball card or collectible, um, there's lots of things that are being uh, now represented in this way. And so one example I like to think about is 
uh, okay, people think about uh, baseball cards, that's fine, but there's lots of other things that you could have and hold in a digital way. A lot of people jump to, well, can I can I trade my, can I get my mortgage as an NFT or can I get my um, any offline pieces of paper? And I don't think that that is really the right way to pursue, but instead, um, and one example I've really liked is, let's say I go uh, go onto Shopify and I buy some high value um, uh, item from you. Um, I could then own some sort of collectible or something I said, I made this purchase, almost like a receipt. And so if I wanna go resell it, I now have proof that I own this thing, right? And it sort of really cuts down on, um, on sort of fraud and really creates a secondary market because I have proof that I'm, if I go and sell this on eBay, I now have proof that I bought it from the, the original vendor. And so um, we've seen people do this uh, for all sorts of, of things, but I think that just taking this concept of a collectible item that verifies ownership of something um, and what can you do with it, and that's gonna blow up, I think, in 2021. So let's talk a little bit more about the Learn product. I mean, a lot of people listening in or watching are, are yep. obviously very interested in just education and blockchain in, in yep. general. You talked about sort of the need for the Coursera for blockchains. Mm -hmm. Doc, tell us a little bit more about people listening on, on the day of the release here. Uh, yeah. Tell us a little bit more about it. Sure, yeah. So the, the insight with Learn was that, uh, you know, I said Coursera because it's an easy analogy, but the way we want to design the product is in a much more community-centric way. Um, and we think that the best teacher is someone in your cohort one step ahead of you, uh, someone who just figured out something, um, as opposed to the, the sort of uh, maybe more lecture model. And so we've designed Learn to be a, a P2P uh, education system. And what that means is that um, the what you'll see in the second version, the first version will not have, the second version is that anyone can go in and create tutorials and then other people can follow them. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when the, we can also have incentives around completing the tutorials. So instead of you paying um, to, to uh, get a, a degree or, or a certificate, uh, you can actually get paid to go and learn about these blockchains. Um, and so what we're doing is we're, we're incentivizing people to create tutorials. You can actually get paid to create tutorials and you get paid to complete them. And that is uh, through partnerships with these different blockchains who are really looking for the go to market, meaning uh, they're looking for how do we expose people to this? How can we tell people who've been a web two developer their whole life about the benefits of this chain? And so um, we're trying to do, do good and do well at the same time. And what I mean by that is we're trying to uh, create a market for anyone who wants to teach folks about uh, blockchains and create tutorials to have a way for them to sustain sustainably do that and also uh, a way for people who want to learn um, to, to go and do that so it is a, a model where we've gone and created the first handful of tutorials to sort of seed the market but really the, the point of it is to um, help people teach each other that's great so if i learn about some new chain and i want to write some tutorials or, or make some screencasts or videos I can upload to this product and then would I get paid in the, in the token of that chain or and that would all be yeah. sort of spelled out? Yep. 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 That's exactly right. So um, it, we're, this is, I would say this is still, this, this will launch, we'll launch with this version where if you go and complete these tutorials or you submit tutorials and um, you'll get paid in the native tokens of these chain. Um, it's all automated. Um, but I, I would say this is, I just want to reserve this as an area where we might continue to iterate. Sure. The reason for that is because I think one of my, things I watch for in the blockchain space is incentivization versus motivation. I think that sometimes we, we focus on incentivizing things, uh, assuming that people are just ruthless robots who only do things for money. Um, it's clear that people do things for all sorts of other reasons. Uh, you know, we're, we're social primates. We, we want to, we want to do things for reasons besides just, you know, more money in our bank account. And so um, we're doing a lot of things more, we're doing a lot more studies, a lot more, uh, sort of uh, work with our users to understand um, why would you want to go and create a tutorial? And what we, well, the big thing we learned is uh, I want to use my knowledge for something. I want to help people. Um, if I know people are doing this and that makes me feel good uh, and you know, the money I'll donate it somewhere. I don't care about it. And so what we're trying to do really is at the end of the day, uh, we want to build like the definitive community of web three developers. That's what we're after. Hmm. We want to build the place where if you want to get started in web three, um, this is where you go. And so uh, I think doing that with just cash incentivizing or token incentivizing is not the way you get there. That's not how you build a community. That's how you build sort of a fly by night. Uh, mm -hmm. People who are just interested maybe in a short term thing. Mm -hmm. And so we're really thinking, trying to think long term about this community of if you wake up every day and think, where should, if you want to get started in blockchain, where do you go? This is what we're trying to build. Love it. Love it.
So then as a developer, what, what can I do today uh, with Data Hub, with, with that product? What kind of things, what kind of things? Yes. Can I Yes, good point. And so just if it's not clear, you know, our hope is that these people who are learning about blockchain will use Data Hub as their infrastructure. Mm. Um, and so we don't plan to ever charge people for learn. The content uh, will always be free. We're wanting people to create more and more content um, because uh, we believe that if, if we create this community, um, then we're, we're creating a market of customers for, for our service Data Hub. And so what you'll see is that most of the tutorials actually use Data Hub because it's, it's the easiest way to get started. And so what you'll see us doing with Data Hub is watching the kind of tutorials people create um, and then just trying to, if, we, as, if they surface any roadblocks, we'll try to fix them in, in this product. So we'll never directly monetize Learn. We'll always try to monetize it indirectly by providing a service that's helpful for people to create more applications. That's amazing. And, and what are some examples of those early tutorials? Like if I, if I plug in and, and experimenting with Chain X, um, what, what's, an ex what's an example of something that I could build? Sure, yeah, so there's super simple examples and more complex examples. Um, uh, uh, since this is going out on Tuesday, um, the network we're first launching with is called NEAR, N-E-A-R. Um, NEAR is a new smart contract uh, platform. They, they sort of pitched themselves as serverless apps. Um, and uh, some of the stuff you'll see on NEAR is a way for you to create a little uh, decentralized exchange if you wanted to sort of start your own decentralized exchange. Here, here's the tutorial to walk you through to do that. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to create your own will token, here's how you create a will token, mm -hmm. things like that. And so um, uh, the idea with these first set of tutorials is to take things which have found traction in Ethereum and found traction out of the blockchains and show you how to do them on this new chain. Um, that's phase one. And then phase two is really, here's some things you can't do anywhere else. And mm -hmm. so the idea is that, um, our sort of secret master plan is that the way we want to go to market is first we want to talk to the existing Web3 developers. And once we create that community, then we want to expand the pie and really talk to Web2 developers. But we don't want to sort of, uh, you know, bring in a bunch of Web2 developers and not have, not have sort of a core community of people who have already been through their paces um, before we bring them on. So then will Data Hub provide the APIs for me to interact with the near? Absolutely. Chain? Is Absolutely. That yep. Yep. So um, uh, we, can, we can link up the tutorials, but yeah. Um, the, the idea is, is um, we'll have code and then the code can just, in your, in your config file, it can just kind of point to Data Hub and it will all work. And so um, if you want to, we're going to position Data Hub as the fastest way to get, get your app running. Love it. Cool. Yeah. Well, any, any final thoughts? Thanks for popping in. I pre definitely yeah. appreciate your time. This has been a, a yeah. great wealth of information in a relatively short period of time. Any, any final thoughts to the, to the entrepreneurs, the Web2 the, the web transitioning to Web3 engineers, and the kind of the early stage investors that are, that are listening in? Yeah, um, so what I would say is uh, I don't want to make any calls about the future, but I think that uh, Bitcoin uh, is going to rise back into the, the public uh, consciousness again because the price is going to go up. Um, and you know, maybe I'll be you know, really wrong about this, but it's, it's, we're, we're approaching uh, all-time highs again. And so what I would say is... Um, as that happens, as we get back in the public space, uh, what I would, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're looking at this space, um, Bitcoin is great and it has a use case. Uh, maybe my, my, what I tell my family is think about it like digital gold, but there's much more out there. And where I'm trying to spend all my time and attention is on this Web3 concept, which is how do we take the internet we have today that we uh, love the value of, but don't like the implementation of, meaning that we have to give away our data, our privacy, and we're sort of exploited and addicted to. Um, how, how can we how can we make a better internet? How can we take back the internet? Mm -hmm. um, so Bitcoin is a good gateway into saying, wow, there's a different way. And I'm not here to discuss the merits of, you know, uh, of, uh, a cap supply currency or anything like that. I'm just saying like, wow, this is something that uh, someone created. And I think that we can look at what we have with Web2 today and recreate a lot of it uh, in a better way. Amazing, cool. Well, we'll be sure to link to all the uh, information we talked about today in the show notes. Andy, really appreciate your time. Great to see you, Will. Thanks. All right, a couple quick things before you go. Number one, I have a general newsletter where I write about technology and startups, and health science, and teaching people to code. And I write about a variety of different subjects that we talk about on this show. So if you go to wclittle.com, there you'll be able to subscribe and You'll also be able to subscribe to particular topics. If you're just interested in one or a few of them, you'll be notified right when I publish new content in those areas. 
Number two, my partners and I at Proto Ventures have a portfolio company called Startup Rocket. If you go to startuprocket.com, there you'll be able to receive coaching guides and customize an operations framework for you and your team and your advisors to be on the same page in terms of what is the appropriate next step for you and your entrepreneurial journey. And finally, if you wouldn't mind leaving a review anywhere that you have listened to this podcast or watched this podcast, it would be super helpful to help those who might be interested in consuming this content as well. Thank you.